people are starting new adventures this week. Children are going back to school. And I've, I spent the end of the week in Cecil County, and I saw them with their backpacks loaded up with their school supplies. And I wondered if they were, hearts were also weighted down with worries about new classrooms and new teachers and new routines, <coughs> or whether their hearts were light with hope for new friendships and learning new things. University and college students, too, are packing. They're packing all their essentials and going off to their dorm rooms. And I was wondering whether what mix they went, what mix of excitement and anxiety. Their parents are hoping that they've also packed their integrity and their perseverance and their faith so they can face all that newfound freedom with good decision making. Those same parents are walking through emptier homes this week and wondering what is going to shape their next stage of their lives. Educators, too, whether they be teachers and principals or businessmen and CEOs, are looking forward to this block of time from September to December or September to the end of the year because they're con contemplating on how to encourage their students and their employees to grow. And they're taking this time to set goals for accomplishment, goals that will cause people to stretch a little bit, but goals that are still within reach. This season of new beginnings, I invite you to go for a walk. Now, the Bible is full of awesome walks with God. God asked Abram and Sari to leave the place that was familiar to them and to go and walk to a place that he would show them. And God asked Moses to take his people on a walk out of Egypt and into a land of freedom. Christ's Good Friday walk was so sad and holy that the route from Praetorium to Golgotha has been named the Via Della Rosa, the Way of Great Sorrow. But God didn't stop walking after Golgotha. Instead, Christ rose and walked with the disciples on the road to Emmaus, giving them new hope and inspiring their next steps of faith. One of the briefest and most powerful walks was recounted in today's gospel lesson that Frank read, the walk of Peter on the water to Jesus. Earlier in the evening, Jesus had sent the disciples ahead to the next destination, and he himself had gone up the mountain to pray. And in the interim, a storm had blown up. And so even though the Sea of Galilee is only seven miles wide, and the people on that boat were experienced fishermen, they did not reach the other side. And about 3 o'clock that morning, on the fourth watch, when they saw something coming across the water towards them, they wondered, what in the world is that? In fact, in the hazy twilight, and in the fear of the storm, they even considered it could be something not of this world, a ghost. But it was Jesus. And he called out to them. And he said, take heart. It's me. Don't be afraid. And Peter, <coughs> peering through the sea spray from the crashing waves, yelled into the battering wind, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you. And Jesus said, come. And Peter, what did he do? Did he slip out of the boat? He's out of the boat. I don't know how you get out of a boat in the middle of the storm. Maybe he leapt over the side of the boat and did the unexplainable. For a glorious, heart-stopping moment, he walked on the water to Jesus. And then the impossibility of the whole situation began to dawn on him. And 
Probably he felt the wind battering him, and he felt the cold grip of the waves arresting his progress. And he was afraid, and as he sunk, he called out, Lord, save me! And Jesus just reached his hand right out to him and caught him and saved him. And as they clambered back into the boat, the winds died down, the sea was at peace, and all the disciples who had witnessed such an amazing thing said, you are truly the Son of God. In the midst of all that chaos and danger, why did Peter get out of the relative safety of the boat? He wanted to walk where the Lord was walking. In the hearts of the other disciples, only fear erupted in anticipation of the way they thought the story would end. And so because they'd been thrashed by a storm all night, their emotions were as raw and as stirred up as the sea. So when they saw something coming across the sea to them, it seemed to them to be a potentially dangerous spirit, a ghost. But Peter saw something else. He saw Jesus beyond the natural boundaries, and he wanted to be with Jesus. He wanted to go beyond his own prescribed limits. It wasn't that he wanted to be Jesus or be like Jesus. He just wanted to be with Jesus in that unbounded place. His desire to be with Jesus was greater than his fear, and so he responded to Jesus' command to come by leaving the boat and walking over the sea towards his Lord. Responding to God's call can be ooh, thrilling and empowering. When we walk with the force of the Holy Spirit, the way things are, can be reconfigured into the way things are supposed to be according to God. Somehow, people who are ill can be comforted, and families displaced by fire can be restored in a new location, and refugees battered by tropical storms like Isaac can find relief, and those who have lost loved ones can be consoled. There's a five-part pattern, a biblical pattern, to God's call in our response. Firstly, God calls. God asks ordinary men and women, children, to engage in an extraordinary act of trust, like getting out of the boat. Jesus commanded Peter to come. Secondly, our first response is usually fear. So when Moses was called on to go and speak to the Pharaoh to demand that the people be released into his care, into God's care, he said, who me? I'm slow of speech and slow of tongue. And last week when we talked about the very young King Solomon coming to the throne, he said to God, I'm only a little child. I don't even know how to go out and come in. Peter overcame the first round of fear because Jesus said, do not fear. And so Peter got out of the boat. But the second wave of fear came crashing down on him when he got a good look at all the danger around him. Fourth, God always gives reassurance. So... God promised a stuttering Moses that he would teach him what to say and how to talk. And God gave Solomon a wise heart, a discerning heart, so that he could reign well. And Jesus reached out his hand and caught Peter. Jesus isn't just our good guide and good coach. He's our savior, the one who does what we cannot. <clears throat> we do not walk alone. God walks with us. Four, 
There's always a decision. Moses led. Solomon reigned. Peter walked on water. We're not God's puppets. We can respond to God's call, or we can decide to walk away like the rich young ruler did after his conversation with Jesus. There's a fifth part is that there's always a changed life. John Ottenberg, the person who wrote the book that inspired the sermon series, says, those who say yes to God's call don't walk perfectly. But they learn and grow <coughs> from the experience. They become part of God's actions to redeem our world. Those who say no are changed too. They become a little harder, a little more resistant to God's call, a little less likely to say yes to the next call. Whatever the decision, it always changes a life. It changes the world that touches that life too. So Peter responds this time with a resounding yes, and he responds again and again to Christ. And each time he does that, he gets a little stronger and a little stronger until he becomes the rock on which Christ built the church. This season of change, I invite you to look for Jesus calling you to take a new step of faith. Now that call and response is going to look different for each person. For some, a closer walk with Jesus will come through new health practices or new prayer practices or beginning a new de daily <coughs> devotional series possibly a Bible study, or even coming to worship more regularly. As one po person posted on Facebook, take a night nature hike and don't say anything. Let God do the talking. For others, it may be a more outward expression of their faith, like becoming part of a work team at church or serving in children's ministry, in a nursery, or in Sunday school. Or it might be becoming a volunteer for youth ministry, or leading a small group or Bible study. And it could even be way beyond the walls of this church. You could be called by God to serve through another agency that helps people or to work through society's structures to um, seek justice and end discrimination. Whether you take a baby step or a huge leap of faith, my hope is that you'll see God at work in the world and hear Christ's call and decide to take that step of faith. Two others facts draw my attention in this story. First, Peter meets Jesus on the water. It's a scary, wet, and windy place. Not in the relative safety of the boat. That means that we can look for him in the turbulent part of our lives during those first week of schools, or during the challenge of college, or during that deafening silence of an empty nest or the loneliness of leading. If we're willing to step out into a disorderly world and expect to find Jesus there, then it's possible to transcend the normal rules and begin to participate in new possibilities that rise up and even engage in the unalterable outcomes that Jesus might want you to take part in changing. Secondly, when Peter stepped out onto that water, the wind and the waves didn't stop. When we take our first step in faith, it may seem that the chaos and the wildness of our lives even gets bigger. Ray Noah 
a blogger, suggests that faith needs a storm or else it isn't faith. He says we need that resistance of the wind to provide lift so that we can soar as we move into this season of new beginnings. I invite you to go for a walk with Jesus. To listen for the Holy Spirit in the thin places. To experience <coughs> the power and glory of God's call for this stage of your life. Because if you want to walk on the water, you've got to get out of the boat. Amen.